This is Think Like a Genius. Tread the line of cognitive psychology, neuroscience, persuasion, and so much more than gray matter. Let's dive in as we fall into a world of intrigue. And now, Think Like a Genius with your host, Lance Vantanar. Tim, thank you very much for reaching out to be on the podcast as a guest. I'm actually really excited to have you on because I did watch your interview with John Canfield and you you discussed some really interesting topics over there, which I wanted to find out a lot more about. And the, I think your approach is also very unique. I know we discussed it before where we talk about John Sarno's work about uh, healing the back and using uh, the brain basically to to heal the body, and how emotions have got a uh, got a big impact on it. But the first thing I'd like to find out, or just you know, let people know about you is one a bit of your history personally. Um, you know, you you're a keen kind of mountain climber, and outdoors person, also very fitness oriented and very health oriented. But I'd like to you know, tease it out and let people actually know what makes you tick almost like outside of the work side and then find out a bit about your history, about uh, your medical practice and um, how you come to your, your current approach of uh, healing people, uh, but using the brain to its, you could say, optimum f- effect. Sure. That's a lot of stuff there, Lance. Yeah, it's a lot of stuff, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, and thanks for, for having me on the show. My purpose is to get this information out uh, for people that need it. And and it's such an important topic, this this issue with chronic pain. I don't know if over in the UK you're having as much issues with the opioid crisis and such, but uh, people are literally dropping like flies over here, getting addicted to heroin, and then getting cut off by their medical doctors because of you know, uh, rightfully being prescribed an opioid for chronic pain, but then the, the the insurance companies and everything cutting them off, and then they're an addict, and they turn towards street drugs, and mm-hmm. they die of of, uh, of overdoses. So um, it, it's really just for that one reason alone. The the brain training and the neuroplasticity is a super important thing. But let me back up the bus and say I never heard of neuroplasticity when I was ten years old when I mm-hmm. first had a back. But I gave a, a, a kid after church a piggyback, and the next morning I got up and I could not move at all for a while. It was my first brush, first brush with the severe debilitating back pain. Mm. Couldn't go to school, couldn't stand up, couldn't sit down, couldn't do anything. I was 10 years old. And what evidently happened, I found out later, was that I kind of had a, a, a developmental fracture and a, and a bone in my lower back. It it just didn't heal right, and I stretched it and stressed it, and I was still a young kid, mm. and that has plagued me ever since. So I'm no stranger to chronic pain. Mm. Um, but I, at an early age, I decided to read everything that I could read about na- natural health, nutrition, training. I was heavily into running. Mm. Uh, starting at the age of 12. And that was the early 70s. There was a big running boom over here in the States. Uh, we, we, I ran cross country and track. That's what they call it over here in the States. And knew very early on I was going to do something in the healthcare profession. And then found out for sure when I turned 19 and I started to have really severe pain down into my legs. It turned out to be sciatica from that old injury at age 10 that I had exacerbated from, from running a lot. Mm. And by then I was always kind of an overachiever athletically. I ran my first 26 mile marathon when I was 16 years old, which was awesome, but not very good for my body. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I have, and, and by eight, by mile 23, uh, I, in that first marathon, I had caused a stress fracture in my lower leg, which um, was I, it was too much training, too much at, at, at a young age. But I was into training, into running. And after I got that debilitating case of sciatica, no one was able to help me. I couldn't run one step for nine months. Wow. And, and then some friends of mine in the running community said, you got to go to this chiropractor. And that's the first time I ever heard about a chiropractor or a chiropractic. 
And I went to this guy, had no idea it was going to happen. It was a last resort. And he gave me an adjustment. And I ran five miles that afternoon after not running one step in nine months. Wow. So I was like, yay, this is awesome. And I decided right then to, that I was going to be a chiropractor mm-hmm. and I was going to help other people who were on that, uh, on that bean. So I just, I did just that. I, uh, finished my undergraduate. Uh, I went on to chiropractic college in the Midwestern state of Iowa, where it all began, where chiropractic began, got out, came back to the East coast, started a practice, very successful practice. In the first 25 years, I cared for 10,000 individual people and participated in over a quarter million healing encounters Mm. during a period of time. Um, And since then, I've been in the online space trying to get my message, uh, getting my message out to to a broader audience. Yeah. So and on that, I I never stopped being an athlete since the age of 12. And I'm pushing I'm going to be 60 next week, week, which uh, shocks and uh, surprises me to, the, to even <laughs> say that. Uh, but uh, always stayed an athlete. Uh, I, after the running years, I got into triathlons. I loved that, even though I swim like a stone. But um, I was always one to compete against not other people, but to compete against myself. And yeah. that's always been my thing. And uh, so, and then it rekindled my love for backpacking and technical climbing in the early 90s. Mm. And uh, so climbed a lot of rock, did a lot of ice climbing in my area of of Rhode Island. It's a four hour drive to go to some of the best uh, ice climbing areas in the world up in New Hampshire. So I was up there a lot and then I moved on to mountaineering, started by climbing Mount Rainier on a six day mountaineering course. Mount uh, Rainier is on, uh, is out in Washington State on the West Coast, mm-hmm. and it's a, it's a heavily glaciated peak, and and I was so much fun and so awesome and, and so cool that I decided to do one big mountain a year from then on. So oh. after Mount Rainier, I went to Kilimanjaro the next year, and um, which is not a technical peak, but it was my first brush with high altitude. It's nearly twenty thousand feet high mm-hmm. in Africa, and it was a great experience. And I realized that I not only liked to get to the athletic and the, and the training, which I always loved, and I loved hanging out with people who, who also came from an athletic background and loved the same stuff, mm-hmm. but I loved going to, to places in the world where the tour buses don't go. Yeah. I loved that. that so that, I loved the whole picture of that, the training, the people, traveling to areas that are, that are remote and wild still. Uh, so I love that part of it. And so after uh, Kilimanjaro, I went to Denali. And my first attempt on Denali did not make Denali. The, we were stuck on the side of um, Denali in Alaska for, uh, for six weeks. We, uh, we didn't get to the top because of a bad – we ran out of you know, cooking gas and food, and the weather just never cooperated. But I vowed to go back. And a few years later, did go back, was able to get to the top of, of Denali. And that, and on the top of Denali, I thought maybe, just maybe, I could have the stuff from Mount Everest. But I wasn't sure. Mm. So I did a bunch of climbing in the, in the Rocky Mountains, a lot of rock climbing um, in the Sierras, and just trained, trained, trained. Took another trip down to Argentina to climb a mountain called Aconcagua which is the highest mountain in the Southern Hemisphere. Mm-hmm. And it's the highest mountain outside of the Himalaya okay. as a final test. Because I wanted to see, because I come from uh, sea level, mm. and I wanted to see what my body and mind would, would, would how would we respond to 7,000 meters. Uh, so got up to the summit of, um, of Aconcagua, 7,000 meters, did very well, and then set the goal to go to uh, Mount Everest, which I did two years later. That was in 2007. And I promptly failed. Did not make the summit of Mount Everest. (laughs) Tired the whole time, mentally and physically. And the number one lesson that I got from not making it, and I'm sure you're going to want to come back to this later, I realized that I I could not, for the life of me, see myself at the top. I had yeah. read too many books. I had a lot of fear. Uh, people on an average Ever- Everest climb, six or seven people die on an average year. Wow. And that was hard for me to wrap my mind around. 
And sure enough, six or seven people died in 2007. And it, it just it stressed me out. I never felt comfortable. I could not visualize myself on the summit of the mountain at all. And I got sick. I got a lung infection. I got a throat infection. But I'm convinced that it was a body-mind syndrome, that mm -hmm. because of my anxiety and my stress and my fear, it lowered my resistance. I got ill. Yeah. Um, so initially, my first thought after making a half-hearted summit attempt and having to turn around and, and go down with my climbing partner, Pinjo Sherpa, uh, I hiked out alone. It takes three days to hike out to the nearest airstrip where you can catch a, a small plane back to Kathmandu. And initially, I was like, I'm never going to climb again. I hate this stuff. This is ridiculous. I never even want to see a picture of a mountain for the rest of my life. Um, and then that was the first day. And then the second day, I thought, well, if I change my training and if I, and if I change my headspace and if I do this and I do that, maybe I could get to the top of, of Mount Everest. But then I remembered, oh, I hate mountains. I'm never going to do this again. So I had like this war of good and yeah. evil in, in my mind. And then the, the third day, I got up and I was like, I'm totally coming back. I'm totally going to change this, this, and this. And I'm going to come back to Mount Everest in 2008. And one of the things I did, because you can only climb once a year on Mount Everest because the weather window only opens up for four to 10 days in late May. So you only get one shot per year. Mm -hmm. So I had to wait an entire calendar year to go back. But I changed my training. I changed a bunch of things. But the most important thing I learned from, from failing in 07 was that I could not visualize myself on the top. So I knew I had to change that. So during that, that year wait until I could climb again in 2008, I read every sports psychology book that I could get my hands on. Every one. And every, the common denominator for that it all came down to one word. Word. You know what that one word is, Lance? Go on. Visualization. All sports psychology is, is visualization. And I learned to visualize. And when I went back in, in 2008, it seems like a simple thing. It's not very simple because those little voices in the back of my head kept creeping up and saying, you can't do it. You're not good enough. It's not going to happen. So yeah, I had to deal with all those, all those little negative thought worms that were in my brain and focus in and absolutely see myself at the top of Mount Everest and most importantly, successfully descending. So I was able to do that in 2008. And that is the single most important reason why I got to the top in 08 and did not get to the top the year before. Okay. Let's dive into that specifically because... People talk a lot about visualization and how you can use it. I think it's misrepresented in things like um, what's the law of attraction and all that kind of thing um, because I think it's, it does it injustice in the way that it's represented that people can sit down and visualize something and you know automatically everything is just going to fall into place. I think it's, um, there's, a, there's a couple of things kind of missing in the story. Uh, which I'd like to find out a bit more from from your experience. You said the visualization you had to change to get, get everything in sync. Um, right. So there's there's my perspective is that not only do you need to get the visualization, you've also got to get your your heart and your belief system behind the visualization. So it's it's a it's a complete focus. It's not just the mental focus and a intellectual focus. It's got to resonate almost to your being. So, Visualization is an active process. So it's not a passive process. Yeah. It's, it's not, it, it, I think it's a, the, the, the law of attraction is important, but it's a small part of what it comes down to. So the way I did it mm -hmm. is I looked at people that I knew on my team that first year, some of whom I thought I was a better climber than, and some of them I thought were just like dramatically better than me at that particular, at, at climbing. They acclimatized better, they were better athletes, but there was also some people who I didn't think they were as good an athlete as me, and I was a way better climber than them. And interestingly, 
some of the people who I deemed who were a lot stronger me or stronger than me or a better climber didn't make it. But then there were some folks that were that were not as talented as me, not as good of an athlete as me, who actually did make it. So I had photographs of these two people in mind, two of my fellow climbers on that team, and I looked at them every single day for for a year, mm -hmm. and I meditated on that. That was a very active process. And I had a lot of mantras that I constantly beat into my brain and worked on for the entire year and on the climb because once you're on the climb a lot of things go wrong yeah it's not just everything works perfectly no there's a million things that go wrong so you have to deal with it uh during those down times especially it's easy when things are good yeah. it's easy when you're winning to to be on top of the world but what happens when you're down and when you're really stomped down and you feel horrible that's when it it, it counts so it's a very active process visualization, not not a passive process. When you were doing the visualization of the meditation, um, did it get to a point where you could almost say where it felt seated in you that you said, okay, now that belief kicks in, now that feeling, that, that confidence in yourself was there. That's, that's when you felt it was like, okay, I'm there. You know, this is happening. Yes. Uh, I had, I, I summarized all those five books into one page of notes that I brought right to the summit with me. Mm -hmm. And to this day, those little mantras are so powerful for me that they make me cry. I do a lot of presentations. I teach a lot. I do a lot of uh, from the stage teaching. And whenever I talk about those and put it up on the screen, and reread a few of them, I inevitably get a little teary eyed. They were very powerful for me. So if you can, and your audience, if you can find that kind of focused mantra for yourself, you know it's the right one for you. Mm -hmm. Very, very powerful for me. And whenever I repeated those, when I was in a really down and dark time, I knew I had it. I knew I was recentered and I was ready to go. That's really quite interesting. Now, the, the other thing I, I wanted to find out a, a bit more about, which you, you spoke about in your interview with uh, John Canfield, is that you're talking about how you, uh, obviously, as a, as a practitioner, you were involved in, in, in treating people for back pain and various other things. Um, now, you also made a, a change from telling people what is good for them uh, and this also comes down to the fact that you uh, you lead by example which i think is a really excellent approach because it's difficult i, I find it difficult when you go going to a gym and you've got somebody who's a personal trainer who's training other people and they look less like a personal trainer than what some of the people are in there that are that are actually training on a on a day-to-day -day basis yeah. so that yeah. doesn't say to me that they dialed into their nutrition and they really focused on on showing a customer that that they look good so your approach sure. of leading by example i think is really important but i'd like to find out a bit more about the the, the socratic method uh, and how you came about to actually using the Socratic method, because I think uh, I'm not sure if that's something that tied into your um, personal challenges and your mountaineering that it also changed your approach, or was when did your Socratic, um, you could say, approach to healing come into into play? Was it? before Everest, after Everest, or when did that the, that uh, all happen? Uh, I w well, I, f I got into practice first in the late 80s, and um, my personality is such that I know better, I need to tell my patients what to do, and they damn well better, better follow whatever I tell them because I've got the answers. Mm. And you know what? I got great results. Um, that worked to a particular point. But as years went on, 
I was very disappointed because my patients would get better from what they came into the office for. Some neck pain, shoulder pain, back pain. They were getting good results. They were very appreciative and they left. But from the get-go, my whole thing was I wanted to make a good, strong dent in their entire life. I wanted them to be a healthier person. That was my visualization. Mm. And I was really disappointed because people were not making the recommended changes in nutrition, exercise, mindset that I was telling them. I was fixing the problem that they came in for and they were happy, but they were just as overweight, just as sick, just as unhealthy, just as miserable as they were when they were they came. So I was unhappy with my ability to motivate people to really make a strong dent in their life. And again, I was I was telling them what to do. You should do this, 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 and this. And it was disappointing because I I what I would change the way that I would deliver that. But what I it was then that I that I really got into the Socratic method and started asking more questions rather than telling. And then things started to change. Though I've since learned some some better ways to deal with the Socratic method, and I'll I'll share those with you. Mm -hmm. People have a lot of roadblocks up in front of them, and so you've got to remove some roadblocks. And it's not just as simple asking people questions, which is what the Socratic method is, and letting them tell you the answer that they just reveal the the answer that they know is within them. Uh, that's the Socratic method. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of blockages. People have a lot of vanities that have to kind of come out of the way before real a real breakthrough can be made. So the what I've, I've worked with late, lately uh, to take that Socratic method and supercharge it and make it super val valuable is to really address three things. And it's, it's kind of... Uh, it's, it's, you've got to address the person's desire to change. Yeah, agree. And if you don't address the person's desire to change, then those roadblocks to healing or, or breakthrough are not going to be out of the way. Some people just don't have a strong desire to, to change. And it's amazing to me, and it's amazing to you probably, that people won't do everything that they can do to get healthy. But that's just the simple truth. Some people do not have a strong desire to heal. An example of that is people you know, who smoke cigarettes. I mean, there's a label on the pack of cigarettes that says it's going to kill you. Your lungs are going to rot out and fall out of your body and turn black. But still, do, do some people, does that, has that motivated anybody to stop smoking? No. Maybe it has. But they're, they don't have the desire that's strong enough to change. So now I address that desire and we talk about it. The second part is the person has to have the resources to change. Uh, you have to have the technology. And that, you know, for me, I offer a six week course for people in chronic pain to get to, to minimize the pain 25% in six weeks and get back out there and enjoy your life. Uh, most of my clients are people who want to get active again, get on their surfboard, get on their paddleboard, get back on their bike, get back climbing, get back skiing, all that. So I have the resources to, to for them. So it's desire and it's resources. But the third one is a big one, permission. People have to not only have the desire and the resources, but they have to give themselves permission to change. And that is deep-seated in people's psyche. Not everybody gives themselves permission. Sometimes pe people feel that it would affect other people or uh, deep down psychologically, they're, they're, they're rewarded for staying in pain and not making a change. Um, and again, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychologist. But we, we do, I do go over this with people. And then I, I have various techniques and resources that help them meditate on this and they bring to the table if they're having any uh, permission issues. So it's desire, resources, and permission. And that's kind of the graduate level course of the Socratic method. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to unpick that a bit more with regards to uh, the, the permission. How did you come about that? How did you 
realize that people weren't giving themselves permission to actually make these changes? Uh, well, because people were just giving lip service to it and not getting out of the blocks, and just not starting. And so I realized just, I can't remember, there was just one client who, uh, in particular, that uh, very successful woman, and by the way, women are more tapped into their emotions and are therefore better at healing their own back pain and other chronic pains than men are. Men have more blockages, more, it's harder to get permission for a, for a man to give himself permission to change and, and, and get healthier than it is for women. That's just my observation. And I think it's because they're more tapped into their emotions than men are. Is it because men have got a lot more, you could say, ego in their way? I think it's an ego thing. It's a cultural, like we're strong. We don't have any problems. We're invincible. Nothing is going to move or shake us. And we kind of put emotions on the back burner, especially difficult emotions. We put on the, we just want to push those away and stuff it down deep rather than dealing with it. And women don't have that blockage. Yeah, I think that also ties ties into almost a cultural issue because culturally, men are not allowed to one other show emotion, or they're not allowed to be emotional in any way, shape, or form. Because as you say, they need to be seen as strong, capable. You know, various other ways. You know, hiding any kind of form of weakness because emotions are people see emotions as weakness. Where it conversely, it's actually the emotions that actually give you power. Emotions right. are emotions are key when it comes to one remembering things, recalling information, storing information, but also emotions are incredibly powerful. They can actually, as you know, cause injuries and actually hold you back from actually healing yourself. Because you can you can carry sure, those sure. That, that emotional baggage with you, and as it said, it is just as a, as the term says, it's emotional baggage, which means you end up carrying it with, and you don't you don't give yourself the chance to let go of it, so you can actually get on with your life. So that and let's not and let's realize also that men die before women, and I just think that's the primary reason, because we're. It, it, we make ourselves more sick, speaking from the man's standpoint, by stuffing all this stuff down and not dealing with it. Mm. And it shortens our lifespan. Yeah. By five or six or seven years even. Which so, is, yeah, just interesting. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting, interesting approach. Now, coming back to <clears throat> neuroplasticity and um, how you're using that to actually get people to change because neuroplasticity is something that's, uh, that's come more to the fore in the last number of years when people or when researchers actually realize that the brain is a lot more capable of adapting and changing and actually remapping when it comes to learning and relearning and actually getting, you could say, unlearning old behaviors. Um, sure. But you've still got the bit of a dichotomy because you've got the conscious and the subconscious and the big challenge is obviously once something is in your subconscious it's a lot more difficult to unpick and get that out of out of the way for you to be able to get the benefit out of that and that seems to be the big challenge is trying to identify subconsciously through either awareness or meditation to be able to um, unpick things and, and get to the next step so how do you go right. about getting to that point to be able to get into the subconscious to make the changes? Well, the f when I first start with a new client, like I just started with a new client yesterday, the first thing, you can't blow them out of the water because mm. there's there, it, 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 some people are just not ready for this, that, that, that the brain and its pathways has so much of a, of a role in human health. Mm. So the first thing is just kind of some basic anatomy that – a hundred percent of pain resides in the brain. The client can come in with back pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, big toe pain, stomach pain, whatever, but a hundred percent of all pain is, is in the brain. 
it must it, it might be a body part that hurts, but it's all interpreted into the brain, and that is a big that's a big issue that that we first have to agree on, or they have to be exposed to, and that's a scientific fact. But how many doctors or therapists or chiropractors or anybody have ever told anybody that truth? Because they're all working in their particular realm, and they're not really sharing that. Even less practitioners are dis- are discussing with that client how to use the brain to heal. So the first step is always getting that, is allowing that new client to just get used to the idea that this is new, that the brain is where uh, at least 25%, and I throw that out there because it's a manageable number for people to grasp. Mm -hmm. I've had some clients that were cured 100% almost overnight when they realized that it was primarily uh, brain-based and that they were holding on to all these layers of, of stress and strain to that. But it was never, it was, it was not even a real problem. It was created entirely by the mind. I, I can't promise people are going to get 100% better overnight, but I have witnessed that, and it's a pretty powerful thing. But what I, go ahead. So that's, first, first, uh, first thing first, the, 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 the part about the pain I, is, Although I realize it vaguely, um, I've not looked into it in that big detail. So I, I, uh, I'm, I'm really interested to find out how do you present it to a person to, you know, to, to get them to actually accept something like that? Because obviously people are sensory in their registration of pain because, you know, if they burn themselves, cut themselves, or you know, they, if they injure themselves with muscular bone or something like that, the pain is obviously localized and people register it. And then obviously the reaction is, oh, I'm in pain, which means they react to it. So how do you get them to actually realize that the, the, the pain is brain-based and that they can actually let go of that pain or they can actually not feel that pain quite as intensely? I have a number of different exercises that I lead them on. I also just share a bunch of research. Uh-huh. The research is really cut and dried. The pain is in the brain. And the brain, number two, the brain is changeable. The brain changes. Uh-huh. So they just have to be aware, basically, of the fact that pain's in the brain, scientifically proven. It's also scientifically proven that the brain changes. Yeah. And we are. I'm working with this client. To do just that, to I, I I don't use the term neuroplasticity a lot with the lay public mm-hmm. because it's woo. Yeah, your brain changes. Yeah. So pains in the brain, your body, your brain changes, and we're gonna we're gonna brain change. And this is an avenue that's not been done with you, Mrs. Jones, Mr. Jones, whoever you know that my client is in front of me. So we start there, but the next step is very important. And the next step is to really get them to see a time in the future to set, to, to set a visualization of a better them. Mm-hmm. So if they're not active, if they can't get out of their chair very well, if their bicycle is gathering dust in the garage and, they, and, and because of this pain, um, we want to, to move that to a, to a, to a goal Mm-hmm. In a particular time where they can see themselves going out, getting the, the bike, filling up the, the air and the tires, and getting on that bicycle and going for a bike ride. And we have various exercises that we, we get to that point. But it goes back to their desire and giving themselves permission. And I find if in that step, if it takes a week or 10 days and they can't see they, they can't get to the point where they can see them healthy, then I, then I know that they have not given themselves permission or they don't have the desire to get better. So uh, they have to give themselves, they, they have to have the desire, number one. I can't fix that for no. them. But we do have a lot of techniques that we can work with them to get, to help them give themselves permission to move on. Uh, because we, it, it's a, it, 
being unhealthy is is bad for you, but it's also bad for everybody around you, your yeah. family, your loved ones, everybody. And once they get to understand that, then they give themselves permission. Then we can set the goal for a better future. That works into the whole visualization thing, and that client's going to get better. Yeah. Something that I've been looking at a lot recently, uh, I've known for for a while that breathing is uh, very key to actually changing stress conditions within the brain because of the vagus nerve and the link to autonomic nervous system and also the fact that the vagus nerve is quite key in actually um, health and also changing you know the st stress conditions in the brain it's the easiest way that you can actually change a stressful situation or body stress conditions in the brain just by doing correct breathing and there's a lot of research that is now supporting uh, uh, the, the approach of learning how to breathe correctly abdominal breathing but making sure you develop breath control to help support your body's immune system, but also has got a number of other benefits with intestinal health, obviously heart health, heart rate variability also comes becomes a, a key thing in that because it actually improves um, the heart rate of variability by by a better uh, better breathing. But how much have you found that breathing plays a big part in this process? We we. I propose what at the very first week we start working on breathing and I have to keep the breathing very simple. And I propose uh, box breathing. Have you heard of box yeah, breathing? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's one, two breathing, yeah. just a ratio of, of one inspiration to two expiration. Mm. And that taps into the parasympathetic uh, nervous system, yeah. which is the vagus nervous part of the parasympathetic yeah. nervous system. I mean, we have, you know, uh, the, there's the autonomic nervous system, which is you know, we have no control over, mm -hmm. but we do really. And half of that is the sympathetic and half is the parasympathetic. Mm -hmm. Pain is a sympathetic aspect of the autonomic nervous system. It's stress. It's increased heart rate. It's uh, increased heart rate. It's, it's uh, fight or flight. Yeah. And the parasympathetic part of the nervous system is the calming, zen digestion elimination that that and so we want to tap into that we can't be in a pain sympathetic driven body and get healthy we have to be in the parasympathetic no uh, mode to get healthy and to get better and so tapping into the to box breathing or one two breathing for example inspiration for a count of three and then expire for a count of six and you can do this instantly. Yeah. And when you do this regularly, congratulations, you're meditating. Yeah. People don't realize it's, that. It's the simplest yeah. part of, of meditation is, is, is that type of breathing. Yeah. And tapping into the, the parasympathetic nervous system and you're slowing things down and that's your healing mode. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And another way we can stimulate our, our, our parasympathetic nervous system and, and particularly the vagus nerve is in the morning or throughout the day, if you want, splash your face with cold water. Yeah. That's a vagus nerve stimulator zen. Yeah. I do it every morning. Yeah. I try to uh, have cold showers as often as possible once once I've done some uh, early morning uh, training because I'm, I'm quite fortunate uh, that I can go to, go to gym first thing in the morning and then when I do get into it and I do do regular cold showers in the morning, it it really does kick you in. It 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 wakes you up something chronic. But after about a minute or so, you actually get used to the cold water and then you start relaxing and it actually becomes quite invigorating and quite enjoyable once you get over the initial shock. But yeah, right. that the, that initial shock can be uh, quite hard because Ouch. It's, yeah, it's like <laughs> a bit yeah. of hyperventilation. Yeah. But yeah, it's right. uh, it's a it's a really excellent way mm -hmm. of actually stimulating the vagus nerve and actually getting your immune system going. And also, uh, if you go to more the extreme lengths and you have ice baths and something like that, it it really puts you in a in a really you could say concentrated forced position where your vagus nerve gets uh, you could say over, not overstimulated but very heavily triggered because obviously it, it responds very strongly to the cold. But uh, ice baths, 
anybody who watches a lot of football or any of the sports games will see that a lot of the the um, the athletes come out from from a game or anything of that nature and they actually get into ice baths because it's really good for recovery healing it's got a number of other benefits on that so decreasing inflammation yeah yeah it's, which right. is which is a big thing and where breathing because you're stimulating the vagus nerve it, it has a big impact on actually reducing inflammation and actually getting the body to uh, self-regulate and actually kick in all of the healing processes that it needs to get better so it's it's right. one of the one of the easiest ways of actually starting healing process in the body. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The other thing I'd like to sorry you you were going to say something else. Well, some of the other things that are important, but uh, not probably not high. Uh, the main thing is the brain heals. Yeah, the brain changes, but also people need to live a, a anti-inflammatory lifestyle too. So. I propose, I, I talked to them quite extensively about a, more of a plant-based nutrition, detoxifying, uh, plant-based lifestyle. I'm not mm -hmm. into diets. Diets yeah. don't work. Lifestyles work. Completely agree so, with you. Right. Uh, am I a vegetarian? No, I'm not. But I've decreased over the, the, over the years significantly my red meat intake and even my fish and, and poultry intake too. Uh, when I, I, I'll have red meat, maybe once a month, mm. maybe I'll have fish maybe once a week, but five days a week, we're plant-based two days a week. We'll have some, uh, some meat and, uh, that ratio works pretty well for me. So, but, uh, you can't get enough vegetables as many different fruits and vegetables that you, that you can. And, uh, that's what we propose. So, um, that's not as important as the brain stuff, though. People have to get the brain stuff, but there's other things. And, and you've got to move your body. I mean, that's the big three. There's the physical dimension of our body, which is how we move our body. There's the chemical dimension of our body, which is what we put do or do not put in our mouth, mm -hmm. mainly in the form of nutrition. Yeah. And then there's the psychic dimension. By far, the psychic dimension is the most important for, for pain relief. But you've got to move your body, and you've got to you've got to eat properly. Yeah. So um, that's the way we approach it. I agree with the and poor John Sarno. You brought up a John Sarno. Poor John Sarno he passed away a couple of years ago. He was ninety four years old or something like that, and he was hammered by his contemporaries. Nobody listened to him hardly when he was older, uh, when he was writing his stuff in the seventies and the eighties. But he came up with brilliant stuff. And like you said, I think he was a little light on, he was good at identifying the problem, a little light on what you should do about it. Mm -hmm. But but his contemporaries since that time have really taken the ball. We have all the information that can really get people better uh, with a lot of the contemporaries that have, that have been uh, inspired by Sarno, but they just ran with the ball after that. Have you found that uh, John Sarno's work was actually um i wouldn't say pivotal but but something that confirmed a lot of your own beliefs yeah absolutely and it was interesting in the 80s everybody had i would say everybody but there was a ton of people that had ulcers back then mm -hmm. ulcers were big and they were they were due to stress and and they were due to this and they were due to that and then it came out that there might be a microorganism that might be related to ulcers. Everything was ulcer this, ulcer that, ulcer this. But as soon as it came out that there might be a microorganism involved, ulcers were never an issue again. I hardly ever hear about an ulcer right now. Yeah. Nobody talks about ulcers. But it was a huge stress thing. Uh, so people were convinced it was like a mind over matter thing. They, they got an ulcer because they were stressed out. Interestingly, what seems to be happening is in the 80s, 90s, in the 2000s, and here we are in 2020, that back pain has become the new ulcer. It's what is a psychogenic type of problem. And once part of my mission is to get this, to get this world to understand that it's more psychogenic than physical, then I think it's going to go away too, just like ulcers did. So the question it's is physically impossible for go ahead. So I, I've, I fully agree with you. I, I think 
the 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 question that I have I have with regards to this is what's going to be the next back pain then? It's going to be something else until we evolve as a uh, society and culture and world, and we realize that we've got to stick how our internal brain, uh, conscious and unconscious environment determines our health. Yeah. Yeah, we've got to eat right. Yeah, we've got to move the body. But the big picture is is the connection between the conscious and subconscious. And, you know, the whole answer, and this is what the last week of my, of my class is all about, the summit of the Mount Everest for all of us is awareness. Being aware that our emotions play a role in our health. That's the summit, is the awareness, is the summit. My first book, the whole lesson was, yeah, it was my first book was a story about climbing Mount Everest, but it really it was an allegory for getting to the getting to the to the summit, which is awareness, mm. personal awareness. And then healthcare, drug sales and healthcare costs will plummet when people get that idea. So it comes, it's it's an approach that I've, you could say, written about. I, I have start, uh, I have written a book, which is uh, something that I'm planning on publishing. But one of the things that I've come uh, realized is that you don't just think with your 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 brain, you think with your body as well. You once you start realizing that your your body and your brain is integrated and you you're a, a very complex whole. The brain can be really, really basic in certain of those functions. It can be like survival mode. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. And I've got to function this way. And then you've got the more, you could say, elevated aspect of it where the creativity and the, you know, the, the capability of moving people and creating stories and doing something fundamentally wonderful with, with what you've got in your life is, is something else. But it's actually realizing that you've got this really integrated unit. And unless you actually realize that these two things are very intrinsically linked and you've got to look after not just the only way you can look after the brain is by looking after the body. You can't just think, oh, the brain and the body is two separate things. I can just, you know, I can drink loads, I can smoke loads. It doesn't affect the brain. Um, right. if, you, if you look at things now, alcohol has got a massive, massive impact on rest, recovery, anything else. So, you know, as a, you know, as a mountain climber and as a, as a, as a, you know, outdoorsman, you probably realize that when you have a drink, the your your next day's recovery, your next day's capability is massive, massively impacted when, once you've had a drink. And to be honest, a lot of people don't realize it, but alcohol is really difficult for the body to process. It, it's got a massive impact on you because you start burning up loads of calories to be able to process the alcohol. You use up huge amounts of resources, you're using up a lot of uh, water in your body to be able to um, have an impact on it. And the knock-on effect with your rest and your recovery and your sleep, heart rate variability is hugely impacted because of it. And sure. I, I think part of it's also the the whole approach in media and also culture and society that alcohol is seen as a coping mechanism, and it's acceptable to have it as a coping mechanism. And you know you can hide your emotions by having a drink. Or you can cover your emotion. You're basically swallowing an emotion by having a drink. You know, I need to sure. get over it. Or I need to get over some stress. So I'll have a drink. And you just swallow that emotion as part of the process. It's not. You're just exacerbating the problem for a later stage. And as you start becoming more and more dependent on drinking down or swallowing the problem, you you just worsen the problem over a period of time. Um, and right. I think the the whole cultural presentation as alcohol as a coping mechanism is really um, very skewed. I think it's a very bad mm -hmm. message. A lot of people are presented, even from a very early age. If you you, know, you can see it all around you, it's like everybody looks at alcohol as a way of coping with either stress or 
a good time or anything of that nature instead of realizing you can actually cope without it and once you actually tap into what it feels like to be aware of your emotions and how you actually should react to it you don't actually need alcohol to kind of deal with something yes I, and I see some positive changes in, in, the, in society culturally in that regard too there's you know beer free year organization mm. um, there's uh, a lot of non-alcoholic cocktails that are they're trendy now herb mm. based um, I think I see society going in a better direction and I see young people drinking a lot less than I did when I was their age we were you yeah. know and that's changed and it's awesome to see that that's good that's good Tell me a bit more about your books that you've written and also, you know, your plans for the future, because obviously you talk about your program uh, for, for treating patients, but what is your, you could say your, your big goal? Cause you, you mentioned quite a big goal in, in John's interview. Uh, well, my big goal is, is, is I'm seeing clients right now culminating a lot of data on my program to put out my third book, which will come out next year, 2021. Um, and I'm just getting all the stats. My ultimate goal is not to put out another book, which some people will read and some people won't read mm. though. My mission really is to, is to kind of make it real for people that the brain is the cause of chronic pain. That's where it lives. The brain changes and no one's told you this. And I'm going to give you a, a concrete, documentable way that you can do this yourself with a little bit of, I'll provide the resources, mm -hmm. you provide the desire and the permission, and you don't have to take any additional drugs, you don't have to go to any additional doctor visits, you don't have to pay all kinds of deductibles and insurance fees after a while. I think it'll decrease the, the usage of the medical system. Uh, not just for back pain people, but just everywhere. Um, and so I want to make it real for people. I want to I want to demystify this whole thing and make it simple for people to participate. And they don't have to go anywhere or do anything. They just do it themselves. So that I think I I'm still working with simplifying it because I, I have the tendency to give too much science and then people shut off. Yeah. Um, so I want to I want to have a balance between the science and the links, so people can go do more research if they want, but to make it real enough and doable enough, so it gives them permission that they can get the barriers to self healing out of the way and move on with it. Um, and I think that can that's going to be a revolutionary type thing. That's so a, that's my big mission. That sounds fantastic. So. When it comes to something like that, as always, I've looked at this seven days from Sunday. Um, I've never found uh, anything else but desire, as you say. Unless somebody has got a really strong desire to have to to make a change, they're not going to make the change. There's going to be no real need for <clears throat> them to want to change, and there's going to be no real need for them to take that next step and the big thing as you've said is is tying it all down and bringing it down into really doable concrete facts so it's conceptualized in a way that somebody looks at it and it's like you know that that makes sense to me this is something that I can do so the big or not the big question but the question is how do you get people to get to that point where they look at it and they think, you know what, I think I can do this. That you're almost that first belief step and that change. How how do you get people to be drawn into that to say, yeah, um, I think I can do something like this. I think I can make a change because they could have the desire, but they could also be in a situation where they feel so trapped that they don't know which way to go. And that sometimes is a bit of a big issue because the brain can be just as good as healing where it can also do something else, which is I'm trying to keep you safe, 
and the only way of keeping you safe is not to do anything. So this looks too risky exactly. or this is not something. How do you get people to get out of that almost like that, that, that frozen state? And there you hit on it because, again, it's, but if you have the awareness that your longstanding emotions around pain has perpetuated your pain, then they can start to have to breathe better and to say, I can do this. I can make a change. But until they understand that this vicious cycle of emotions has has added to their pain, they can't give. They don't. They can't grasp the desire to the, to improve. They don't believe that they can improve. Mm. So that's the hardest thing is uh, that desire piece. Some people innately have the desire, and that's why working with athletes really is the, is is the easiest way because they want to. They want to get back on the bike. Yeah. They want to get back on the climb. So that's a, it's an easier audience to work with. Um, but it's the it's the really tough people to work with are the people that are not athletes who are not actively don't you know maybe haven't competed or done anything athletic since high school gym class. That's a population that really I have no idea how to get to. I have no idea. So I'm not, I'm not working with that population. <laughs> uh, I, I used to, I just don't do that anymore because it, they're frustrated and I'm frustrated, but so I want to work with people who want to get active. Yeah. So we're halfway, we've got two thirds of the desire piece out of the way right there. And then it's a quick move to get to the rest, but to get the rest of that desire, people have to innately get that the awareness of their psychological state, their conscious and as much of their subconscious that they can get a feeling for, that makes a difference for how quick they're going to get out of this. And if they that, and then if they get that, the awareness, and they also and they have a goal that they want to get back on the bike, for example, you got the desire, and that person's getting better. There's nothing going to stop that person. Yeah, that's. It's always good when you've got somebody that's actively looking for it because it, they they the ones that are more inclined to to be willing to listen, and uh, as you as you said, is unless the person's willing to change, unless they uh, they are willing to go to the right process and actually take the first step and you know start digging into you could say some of the uh, the the brain and and you know realizing that this is a is a change that they can make in their own life and actually sometimes it it can be quite difficult because other people can actually influence whether or not they their view on whether they should do it is is something that's achievable and that that can sometimes also make things very difficult for people who want to change but you know, other people tend to have a bit of an impact on them, but right, right. Yeah, you know, end of the day, the stronger the desire, the easier it is for them to, you know, get to that next step and and start down that road road to recovery. It so sure is. And like we, when we set a goal, you touched earlier on communication between the conscious and the subconscious aspect of of being a human being. Mm -hmm. The connection. There's visualize almost like a little trap door that connects down to the subconscious. And if you can get your conscious desire and your subconscious to be on, to play nice on the same team, mm -hmm. it's inevitable that you're going to get that result. For example, if you set a goal, oh, I need I want to get a new car and I want the snazziest uh, sports car. Let's call it a Porsche, a Porsche or something like that. I want to get a Porsche. And so as a trap door for your conscious mind, the conscious desire to have a Porsche, and you realize that if you get the conscious and the subconscious on the same team, you're going to reach your goals quicker, then the trap door going into the subconscious might be on your computer having a picture of a Porsche mm. in the exact color that you want and the exact model that you want. And that would be a very simple example of the trap door to connect your conscious and your subconscious. People sometimes do this unwittingly, yeah. and sometimes people in the know do it very purposefully. 
So part of what I do in my course is I we create little trap doors from the conscious to the subconscious so they can visualize a, a healthier future. And that helps them give themselves permission and desire to get that result. And then we work, then we walk into the science of it. Yeah. I just want to touch on that a bit more because you mentioned just before we started the call that um, when you were summiting again in 2008, you had pictures of some of the other climbers that made it or some of the other team members or, or, uh, on the climbs that made it and didn't make it. And so that's your example of actually using visualization, but also you could say your motivation of examples <clears throat> of clear examples, examples of how to how to do that is 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 that a good way of actually using that that process? It really is. If people have a model, you know, I tell my story. I had chronic pain. I got better. I have this patient that did this patient so testimonials help people mm -hmm. to get it people have to have a real world example of someone with a similar situation that has overcome it that was what i did in, in everest i i had those pictures up because they were real world examples i knew those stories i knew those people some made it some didn't and that helped me to see that i too have the desire and I have the permission and I have the resources to do this particular thing to get that goal. And clients need that too, who are getting out of pain. Yeah. And it creates a belief system in themselves that this is achievable. And right. Yeah. Sometimes you just need some somebody that you can relate to that can say, Yes, I sure. can I can relate to you. I know your story. I can I can I can see it. I can feel it. I can hear it. It's you know, right. it makes sense to me, which means it gives them confidence to actually go to the next step. So, yeah, yeah it's, exactly. a, it's a really powerful story. So with my program, I constantly have to pare it down, simplify it every day. That's what I spent the whole morning on today. <laughs> I always think. But it's not because it's too, there's too much. You've got to simplify it because this is new stuff for most people. They, they get it on one level, but if it's not simplified really down to the brat, like three steps of this, three steps of that, three steps, then it's just too much and they're overwhelmed. And overwhelm leads to non-compliance. Yeah. It's, if it's too much for somebody to take in, it's, it's the easiest thing is not to do anything. Exactly. And then, but the, there's no, there's no, there's no uh, goodness in, in, in not investing in yourself. There's no, yeah. there's no possibility that that's going to be a good thing at all. So uh, we need to inspire people to do better and to change. And uh, I'm here to do that, do my part on that. Tim, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. And how can people find out more about what it is that you do? Because uh, uh, obviously sure. I'll, keep, I'll put some resources down for, for the books and for your site. I'd say the simplest thing is, is uh, I think I shared my link with you. They, yeah. I've got a couple of downloads that are free. They can go in there. They can. That's going to give them a good background on brain training. Mm -hmm. And uh, you will get some emails from me that also are content driven. I'm not going to sell you anything or, or anything. I'm just sharing content for people to get the big idea that, the, that they can make a difference in their health without drugs, without doctors, without deductibles. And so download those two free uh, reports and uh, they can always reach out to me by my email, which I, you can also share. Yeah. And if they're interested in my books, I have uh, Lessons from Everest, which is a philosophical treatise for people who want to learn more about the failure and success climbing Mount Everest with a philosophical bent. Mm -hmm. You can get that on amazon.com. And my second book, which is uh, touted by Jack Canfield, actually, uh, he gave me a blurb and did a did the cover blurb for this, is called Feet, Fork, and Fun, How to Fail Your Way to Fitness. The Feet, Fork, and Fun are the three dimensions of life that we spoke about. And that went to number three on Amazon's bestseller list. And of course, that's available on, on Amazon, too. Excellent. But reach out if you have any questions. Uh, 
send me, drop me an email and, uh, always love to get in a conversation with folks who, uh, who are looking to better themselves. Definitely. And, uh, I'll, I'll do some digging into some of the pain research you were talking. I'd, uh, I'd love to, uh, obviously find out some more as you, as you carry on with your research and your work and definitely do keep in touch because, uh, I think what you're doing is, is commendable and that you've, uh, you certainly, uh, given me hope because, uh, you're ten years what uh, up on me, so uh, maybe I can <laughs> I can do Everest to find another mountain to climb or something. I'll have to start from scratch because I don't know anything about climbing. It'll take you ten years, but you can do it if it's your goal, if it's your purpose and your mission. Sure. Excellent. Thanks a lot for your time, and uh, have a have an excellent weekend. All right, Lance. Thanks so much. When you support and review a podcast like this from someone like Lance, it gains more visibility and motivates him to produce more. What topics most interest you? The best topic gains a shout out on the podcast.